Hello, I'm Johnny Rowland, your host of The Shooting Show, and welcome to today's program. Friends, we've just returned from a great trip up to one of the neatest places I've ever been, and that's the Cody, Wyoming area. And yes, that's close to Yellowstone Park, and we just have some of the neatest stuff to show you. Some of the neatest things that you'll ever see if you like guns, certainly if you like to study American history. We also are going to be featuring a, an exhibition shooter and absolutely one of the best people uh, anywhere at what he does. Uh, Michael Blackburn is a, a true artist in every sense of the word when it comes to doing some very special shooting. In fact, uh, Michael joins uh, some other really outstanding shooters such as Jerry Michalik, Bill Jordan, uh, Elmer Keith, even Ed McGivern in the Topper Wines, and Buffalo Bill Cody in his program uh, itself. Tell you the truth, I don't know if, if Buffalo Bill was a great shot, but I tell you what, Michael Blackburn could, <clears throat> could have gotten on his program at any time, anywhere in the world. Michael is really remarkable. I know you're going to enjoy seeing some of, the, of his things. Let's let our friend Michael Blackburn open today's shooting show. I want to use this buoy knife as a mirror and shoot over my shoulder. Now, let's get this straight. We have a, a Coke can, cola can, which is a small target. You're going to take this rifle and use that buoy knife. You're going to shoot behind your back using that mirror. Yes, sir. That's it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Michael. That's too small, isn't it? That's a cherry tomato, man. That's not, that's not, high. you can't shoot that with a 22, can you? How much money you got in your pocket? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this, friends. Amazing. You didn't even see me light the fuse on that thing, did you? <laughs> Stay tuned for more of the shooting show after these important messages. The shooting show will be right back after this break for your local cable company or TV station. As many of you know that Dennis Crocker is making these great Kramer holsters available for our full-size 460 1911s, but he also has holsters for guns like this 3-inch model 625 in 45 caliber. He also has holsters for many other types of handguns, such as this Kimber Compact in 460 made of shark skin. And of course, he also offers magazine carriers. If you want the best holster money can buy, certainly from Kramer, give Dennis Crocker a call at area 864-587-8722. Again, area 864-587-8722 for these great Kramer holsters for whatever gun you may have. Well, Michael, of course, is one of the most unique people in his field worldwide for that matter. But today, we're in the Buffalo Bill Historical Museum here in beautiful, and Michael, I'm not exaggerating, am I? Beautiful Cody Wild. I moved here about six weeks ago and I'll never live anywhere else. It is. Friends, you just have to see it to believe it. You know, a lot of us have heard about Wyoming. I've even been across Wyoming on the interstates, but there's so much that people aren't aware of here in this, this fabulous state. And we're talking about not, they're, they're not exactly overrun with population, which means that hey, there's space for people to hunt and shoot and really enjoy things that the American frontier was really built on. In fact, and we see this great mural here, Buffalo Bill Cody, uh, remember Buffalo Bill, he, am I correct, he rode for the, for the Pony Express? Yeah. And put on Wild West shows all over the world. Uh, he was a buffalo hunter. Buffalo hunter, scout, army scout. And he built this town 
as well as what he built another one. What, what, where, where is that? Wapiti. 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 Just down the road about uh, 20 miles. That's where I live. Well, uh, where we are now in Cody is what, about 40 minutes from Yellowstone National Park? Yeah, you're about uh, probably 50 miles from, okay. uh, from the east entrance. And here in Cody, there are uh, numerous motels, hotels. Uh, this is one of the uh, last, I suppose, spots for uh, hotels and meals and things for on the uh, east side. Let's see, where are we? Yes, we're on the east side of Yellowstone, so for the eastern entrance. So this really, uh, friends, trust us on this one. We're going to be walking around. We're going to be showing you some of the things. Uh, this museum is called the Smithsonian of uh, Western and uh, Firearms Exhibits. And after we've been walking around here today, I believe, huh, Michael? I love it here. People ask me why I moved to Wyoming. I can tell them, come to the museum and they'll understand. And you'll it. understand you'll why. understand it. Well, I tell you what, friends, this is one of the best kept secrets in the United States is the great state of Wyoming. Of course, we're about to change that to some degree, but I think you're really going to enjoy this. Now we're over in the firearms portion uh, of the museum, friends, and uh, which just has to be seen to be believed. We're going to look at a few very special guns that are displayed on this particular rack. And of course, they have all kinds of things, not just things that we would think of as antique or, or very old, but they have a lot of modern guns, too. And here's one. Uh, Long-time viewers of this program will have, have seen Ed and Plinky Topper Wine uh, doing some exhibition shooting on our program. This little pump 22 rifle on the bottom belonged to Plinky Topper Wine. Uh, of course, there are many. Each one of these are very uh, unusual and outstanding guns. Here is a chrome-plated uh, M1 Garand. And this was done especially for General George Patton, and he was killed in a car wreck before it was presented to him in the museum while well, certainly wound up with it. Talking about unusual guns, friends, here's the only example of this particular gun that I have ever seen. Uh, I've just seen pictures of them. This particular gun is called a Dardic, and actually it was a tremendous idea. The uh, rounds were triangular shaped, pieces uh, that where you had a, uh, a, a, a propellant charge and a bullet and the stock functioned so, at, sort of as a magazine housing and the empties were ejected. We're going to walk around this thing and hopefully the glare won't get to us too badly. Anyway, it was sort of like a semi-automatic, sort of like a revolver. It was a terrific idea and the Dardic inventor went on to become successful in the military or for a military application, even some construction applications. But see, this was the ejection port here, and as the trown fired, the empty was ejected, and it worked on a revolver-type principle. Uh, an amazing concept, friends, a very fine concept. And I promise you the main reason that this gun did not succeed as a commercial success. It was very sound mechanically. Uh, the uh, uh, projectiles, everything worked really well, but guess what? It was ugly. <laughs> and this is an unusual gun. You don't see that many of these. Friends, this is an English revolver, sort of. This is a Webley Fosbury, and you'll notice these channels cut in the cylinder. And what happens is the top half of the gun, it functions sort of like a semi-automatic and sort of like a revolver. This portion on top actually uh, recoils back, it cocks the hammer, uh, turns the cylinder, and then it goes forward and can be fired again. Most unusual design. Uh, it actually worked. It was a good design. It was somewhat uh, subject to uh, fouling from mud and things, but it was, I'll tell you what, it worked better than you'd think it would. Now, friends, we're looking at some uh, guns, blunderbusses, uh, that were for uh, close sort of combat. Well, here's in fact one with a folding stock actually, but I want you to look at the bore of this particular gun. This is a, a gun to be used in ships. And of course, it was meant for battle aboard a ship, whether it was from uh, getting on another ship or in a mutiny type situation. Notice how the has an oval shaped bore uh, to literally spread the shot as rapidly as possible. This was going to be used at almost point blank ranges. Of course, you see these brass parts here for marine applications, just amazing stuff. My friends realize this museum incorporates the Winchester exhibit. Of course, now we have 
uh, guns from a number of different sources, but uh, this one was a gift from Olin Corporation, an early shotgun. This dates from uh, 1831 to 1834, and I want you to look at how the breech is made here. It has a lifting breech, and I've never seen anything like this, but it fired a paper cartridge. Now, not like what we would think of, but it had a percussion fulminate uh, or had a little capsule in the rear of the paper cartridge. It was patented in 1831. Uh, there, I believe, made in France. So a most unusual piece. Now, friends, you know on our shooting show, we shoot watermelons only when we can get them. <laughs> Have a great time. But this is a different kind of watermelon gun. I'm serious now. This is a gun uh, known in contemporary advertising of the time. This thing dates from uh, 1865 to 1870, made from uh, a company in Montgomery, Alabama, Alabama, I believe. Okay, here we go. Let's read the, the uh, tag here. It says, this trap gun was designed to protect melons by stretching cords in four directions from the upright, upright lugs on the a base on the trap touching any one of these cords caused barrel. So in other words, what would happen is you had trip cords and when the birds or crows or the varmints like raccoons or other things would get in to go after the watermelons and they hit one of the of the cords, it would set this thing off <laughs> and, and it would vacate the watermelon patch. Now friends, these are early attempts at repeating percussion firearms. You'll notice here we have some uh, there were charges in each one of these holes, and you uh, would put a cap here, if we can see this, I hope we can, put a cap on the nipple here, and it fired the charge uh, above it there. So I don't know how successful this was. I don't think it was too successful because you don't see many of these around, but it was certainly uh, the need for multiple shots and firepower was has been uh, considered for some time now. These are other examples of multiple shot percussion guns. Hey, now this is a darn shotgun right here, let me tell you. Actually, it's either a, a darn, a darn A, or a darn E. Probably knowing the French is probably a darn A, you know, but that's okay. Uh, the, the French have had unusual ideas about gun making for a long time, some very successful, some not. This particular shotgun uh, has a sliding breech. Now, look how this thing works. That's a new one on me. Ladies and gentlemen, here's another one of the old-timer guns. I want you to look at the beauty of this Damascus barrel. Realize this is wire or these parts, these are literally layers of steel beaten and welded together. And realize at one time, Damascus steel was much stronger uh, than what they called fluid steel until technology improved. But these, of course, were very expensive because these were all hand uh, hand forged, hand done, had to be wrapped and then beaten and welded. Just amazing, but what an example of the earlier gun makers art. Isn't that pretty? Friends, just some fun things we want to show you. This is a wonderful example, in fact the only one I've ever seen, of the a bore chart model 1893 semi-automatic pistol carbine. And you know the uh, bore chart was arguably, uh, or certainly one of the earliest examples of successful uh, semi-automatic pistol design. And uh, tell you the truth, I really like it, I think, better in the carbine version than I do as uh, just a handgun because they were somewhat ungainly, but this is a wonderful example of that. Others we have here, uh, a number of the European guns. Here is a, uh, 18, a 1903 semi-automatic carbine from Manlicker. Uh, and it is in 7.63 or 7.65 man, man liquor. Uh, it's a, a centerfire cartridge. And of course, uh, here we have a Luger, that uh, a pistol carbine here was fitted with a shoulder stock. Many, many things on display. And just looking at this particular example, some of you may not recognize what this carbine is, but this is, believe it or not, a gyrojet carbine. And some time ago, on our shooting show, we featured uh, one of the gyrojet pistols, and in fact, here is one. And what is even more rare than the pistol is, guess what, the ammunition for the gyrojet. And realize this didn't work like uh, other firearms. And the projectile here is the whole cartridge. 
and you see those little holes in the ends, those are venturis or vent holes that are machined at an angle and it was had solid propellant. It's a little bitty rocket, in fact, is what it was. And we heard reference earlier saying that these things were so much fun to shoot that people shot all their ammo because <laughs> the ammo was very difficult to make. That was one of the drawbacks. Uh, at, at a couple of feet, uh, these things weren't terribly powerful, but you let them get across the room, see, they had a chance to literally build velocity. So here we have an example of the gyrojet pistol and the carbine. This is the first carbine I've ever seen. A lot of stuff here in this museum is the very first uh, example I have personally seen, uh, which is saying something, because we've been to a lot of museums, and it's just remarkable things that they have. Now, friends, I've often said that the Remington Nylon 66 is one of the neatest little guns that they ever made. And this particular gun was used by Tom Fry to shoot 100,000 uh, wooden blocks in 1959, I think, in Reno, Nevada. And this is the gun he used to do it with. So, pretty amazing stuff, and I bet you it shoots good today. Stay tuned for more of the shooting show after these important messages. Now friends, here's one of the most important publications you can get. This is the Great Georgia Arms Catalog. And please write their phone number down, 1-800-624-6861. This is a tremendous catalog with the best ammunition prices available in the United States. Okay, well, here's a mention of the shooting show. Hey, that, that's reason enough to support them right there. But you get superior ammunition at superior prices. Let's look over here. Here we, whoops, let's see, what do we see? 460 rolling, yes indeed, but we also see a tremendous number of other things. 45 ACPs, 44 Magnums, 41 Magnums, certainly our uh, defense load there, defense special 41 Magnum load available, but all kinds of others. 9 millimeters, 357 SIGs, 44 specials, 30 out sixes, 7 mags, all kinds of neat stuff, plus they have components. If you want to load your own, they'll sell you lead bullets, they'll sell you Nostra bullets, all kinds of great features. Yes, in fact, they'll even sell you a 460 rolling kit for uh, the great 1911 guns, cleaning accessories. Uh, here's gunpowder for sale, uh, loading equipment for sale. Friends, give them a call today. These are some of the finest people, period, that I've ever had a chance to meet. Curtis Shipley and our good friend Larry Haney from, from Georgia Arms, and they're helping to support the shooting show. Give them a call today. Get a free catalog, 1-800-624-6861. And please don't forget to tell them you saw it here on our show. Here in the museum, we have all sorts of dates and things about when guns were developed. And uh, for me personally, this is a very interesting circle of guns they have. These are all Civil War era guns, and some of them are rimfire cartridge guns, a lot of them are paper cartridge and linen cartridge guns, because at this time, or during the period of the uh, first half of the 1860s decade, a lot of new ideas were being tried. This was a difficulty that the uh, Northern Army as well as the Southern Army had. There was no mass standardization of parts or types of guns, much less cartridges. So this is a most interesting uh, exhibit of the different ideas and different patents. Uh, each one of these, uh, uh, there are about as many different patent uh, arrangements on these guns as there are guns here on this wall. Most interesting, and of course the best system, which uh, 
uh, wound up being the metallic cartridge, uh, first in rimfire, then later in centerfire, is what came out of all these experiments. But this was a gigantic logistics problem for the northern and southern armies, because what if you broke apart, you're, uh, you're not going to have spare parts for it. And uh, parts broke then just like they do now. I mean, they're just machines. And this is a most interesting exhibit of, of different ideas that some of them won, most of them lost. Um, these are some of the military rifles from around the turn of the century uh, that we're looking at. And this is a Colt model 1878 Philippine, uh, used in the Philippines, the 45 caliber revolver. You know, when the U.S. military went to the Philippines after we had gotten it out of the Spanish-American War, the uh, puny 38 revolvers, not all 38 revolvers are puny, but the ones the military had were, and they just didn't have much luck uh, against stopping an attack by the Moro uh, warriors. So uh, the military had some of these Colt single-action armies as well as these double-action, uh, realized this gun has the uh, ejector or extractor like these single-action armies, but it had a double-action mechanism, and it was in 45 Colt caliber. Uh, these guns were uh, highly desired in the Philippine uh, insurrection there because uh, this large caliber gun might mean the difference in somebody surviving his evening on watch or not. So these are the examples of the Krag rifles and uh, they have a, one open here with some dummy ammo inside. What, uh, the Krag was pretty neat actually because all you had to do was open the side uh, portion of the magazine there and you poured or push it in a loose cartridges and it was apparently a pretty good system it was uh, uh, certainly a, a concept uh, that deserves some some mention another couple of guns that in the same case that deserve uh, a little attention here one is a lot of you will recognize this is a 95 model Winchester which was uh, in fact, Browning has made some new ones, but this was a combat gun. See the bayonet mounted on the end of the barrel there? And I tell you what, this is a, a gun to be taken seriously because it's in 30 alt 6 chambering. I mean, this gun is no joke. It came in uh, 30 40 Krag centerfire, but uh, went on to be chambered in 30 alt 6 So these were very serious combat weapons, very fast firing. Uh, the gun over behind it there in the corner, more so, is a Lee uh, straight pull bolt action. This was a terrific idea that really should have been developed if you ask me and a lot of other folks. But uh, the Navy had uh, used these for a while because they were very fast firing. Realized you didn't turn the bolt up, you just gave it a straight pull back and forth. So uh, this is something that that I think really did not get nearly the attention it deserved was the Lee straight pull bolt action rifle. Stay tuned for more of the shooting show after these important messages. And we want to mention the good folks at Clark Custom Guns in Princeton, Louisiana, one of the most complete gun shops in the entire United States. They do all sorts of things like this specialty meltdown on this new STI gun. Also, uh, they have an excellent staff of people to help you with guns such as these Benelli Super Black Eagles taking three and a half inch uh, magnums. A complete line of handguns, semi-automatics, revolvers, all sorts of neat things in the shop there. And, of course, here's Mr. Jim Clark himself out helping a customer, some of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. They have a complete line of loading supplies, loading tools, gunpowder, you name it, primers. 
uh, all sorts of accessories for your guns, uh, whatever you might need, certainly within reason. Here's Kay Clark Michelik when she's not winning championships, back working there in the office. And here's her husband, Jerry Michelik, the fastest revolver shooter in the world when he's not winning championships at work. Here's Jim Clark Jr. back on the lathe, the same drill when he's not winning championships, working right there in the shop. That's why you can get such complete quality of product and expertise here at Clark Custom Guns. Friends, give them a call today, area 318-949-9884. They have a great catalog. We appreciate them supporting our project. Now, friends, here's an example of why uh, the manufacturer should... <laughs> I'm looking for a way to put this. It won't be insulting any nationality. This is possibly the worst uh, light machine gun ever put in service by any army under any circumstance, uh, probably. This is the infamous French 1915 Shosho, Shaw Shot, ever how you want to say it. But uh, upon looking at this gun, you might suspect that it was a cutaway model for demonstration purposes. Not so. This was what you actually got. And you see these huge cutaways in the magazines here, and you can see the springs. Well, the designers uh, had in mind that this would show how much ammunition was left in the magazine. What it really did, in fact, was to become immediately filled with mud and snow and dirt and become uh, ineffective. Uh, they had very poor workmanship, very poor quality, and guess who bought a boatload of these things <laughs> was our own United States military. Friends, we had, <clears throat> some of us have, have relatives that went into battle in France in 1917, 18, carrying these imitation machine guns. They were dismal and cost the lives of a number of people because they were such terrible guns. Now friends, we've run out of time on today's show, but next week we'll come back to this great Buffalo Bill Historical Center for more features. Let's go to our support group. We have Brooks Communication there in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The number is area 505-888-2929. We have Custom Leatherwork and Saddlery in Denham Springs, Louisiana. Their number is area 225-667-9225. We have Camouflage Technologies uh, there in California. Their number is area 909-674-6488. We have BC Armory in East Leroy, Michigan. Bruce's number is area 616-729-5508. We have Cottrell Refrigeration, Heating, and Cooling in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Wage number is area 256-381-1887. And we have Gearlings Equipment Rentals there in Southern California. Their number is area 909-354-6476. Friends, we want to thank the staff at the Historical Center there for their great assistance to us on the program, and we're certainly looking forward to going back again next week. Thank you for being with us on today's program. We'll see you on the next.